Have you ever wondered what we mean by this mystery of the Trinity? What is it about? What is it that we Christians believe? Welcome to the series on our introduction to the Trinity. My name is Sister Mary Magdalene. I am a Dominican sister with the English Congregation of St. Catherine of Siena, and I will be leading you in a 12-part introductory series dedicated to the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas on the Trinity. In addition to explaining St. Thomas's thought in this series, I will also periodically cite the Catechism, Scripture, saints, or other Thomistic theologians in order to give us a fuller view of our Trinitarian faith, some of which the Church teaches as dogma to be believed, and some of which is still being discussed theologically. So this is part one of our series of the Introduction to the Trinity, and it is entitled Our Trinitarian Faith. Now I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the topic of the Trinity and then talk a little about our participation in the Trinitarian life, since simply to know something intellectually about what God has revealed concerning the Trinity is not enough. We must live it. That is, we must live a Trinitarian life, uniting ourselves to God in prayer and asking for His grace to open our hearts more to Himself each day, each hour, each minute. So I would encourage everyone to commit yourselves now to spending time with God each day and pausing for brief moments even throughout the day to make acts of faith, hope, and love, saying things like, My God, I believe in you. I hope in you. I love you. And then offer whatever you are doing to Him for love of Him and for souls. Now, first I should warn you that speaking and learning about the Trinity is a little bit like trying to explain the color red to someone who is blind. That is, a person who is blind knows by touch what something hot is or may have even burned himself or herself with fire. So you can tell the person that the color red is kind of like heat or fire. And this may give them some vague idea about what the color red is. But until a person has actually seen for himself or herself the color red, it is really impossible to know what the color red is. So it remains a mystery. In a similar way, God, who is infinite, has revealed something of his inner Trinitarian life to us through Christ. And yet, we have to keep in mind that much of what we can say about the Trinity, although true insofar as it is based on revelation, is also necessarily put in human terms and human concepts, since we are, after all, human. And so we have a human mode of thinking, and that is the only way we could understand anything at all of what God has revealed to us. Yet the Trinity itself remains a mystery until the day when we shall see him as he really is, as St. Paul says. Until that eternal day of heaven, we do not see clearly, but only darkly, as in a mirror, by way of faith. That does not mean, however, that we have to throw up our hands and be completely agnostic, but it does mean that what we can know by revelation is in large part known by way of analogy, or a certain likeness, which is never yet a full comprehension of the reality itself. So the Trinity may seem, therefore, to be a bit of a scary topic, because it is a great mystery, just as the Eucharist, for example, is a mystery of faith. However, it is also a mystery which God has chosen to reveal to us in Christ Jesus, and which we particularly see in the Gospel of John where over and over Christ speaks of himself as the Son who has been sent by the Father, and where he promises that both he and the Father will send the Holy Spirit to us. In addition, the very first verse in the Gospel of John begins, 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the same chapter, in verse 14, the Gospel of John tells us that this Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And shortly thereafter, in the same chapter, he narrates Jesus' baptism in the Jordan, in which the heavens are opened, the Father's voice is heard, saying, This is my beloved Son. And the Holy Spirit descends upon Christ in the form of a dove. I am saying all this in order to emphasize the fact that the mystery of the Trinity is, in fact, biblical from the start. Whether or not the actual Greek word for Trinity is found in the Bible, the revelation of the Trinity is there, since the Trinity is the mystery which Christ himself came to reveal. We can never attain to knowledge of it simply by human reason alone. So the Trinity is the central tenet and foundation of the Christian faith, a mystery which we profess every Sunday in the Creed when we say, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. We also affirm this mystery whenever we say the prayer, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. It is into this mystery of the Trinity that every Christian is baptized, using the formula, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. A sacrament which was instituted and commanded by Christ himself, as we read in the last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And we repeat this formula whenever we bless ourselves with holy water, as a way of recalling our baptism into the Trinity. A truly Christian life is, in fact, always centered around the Trinity. The Mass itself is a participation in the Trinitarian Communion, in which we unite ourselves to the sacrifice of the Son offered to the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit. And since we are made in the image of the Trinity with a capacity to know and to love, analogous to the way the Father in knowing himself speaks, eternally generating the Son, who is the wisdom and word of God, and to the way the Father and the Son are united in the bond of love, which is the Holy Spirit. So we too are elevated by grace to know and love God in the supernatural virtues of faith and charity. In this way, as the Dominican, Father Thomas Joseph White, says in his book, The Light of Christ, the interior life of the Christian thus takes on a Trinitarian form as the heart and mind of the human person are elevated into friendship with God, the Most Holy Trinity. Nothing could be less abstract. In fact, this is the most concrete reality that there is, the union of the soul with God by grace. All right then, before we go any further into our study of the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity, I would like to draw your attention to a few things. First of all, we are called to participate in God's own life, and that means that we are called to participate in His Trinitarian life. But what does it mean to participate? Participation for St. Thomas means to have an act or perfection in a limited, imperfect, particular way which is received from the one who has it in an unlimited, perfect, and universal way. In the New Testament, the second letter of St. Peter, chapter 1, verse 4, says that God has granted to us his precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion, and become partakers that is, participants, of the divine nature. 
Now, just as human beings already have a certain participation in created being, which has a certain likeness to the uncreated being who is God, because it is caused by God who gives being to all things, so also human persons have a certain natural participation in goodness, simply because we exist. I'm not speaking here of moral goodness, but the fact that God has created everything naturally good, because he himself is good. Because in participating in God's being, or essay, humans also participate in the other transcendentals, those realities which are convertible with being, and transcend all particular categories of being, because they are common to all of them. So goodness is one of the commonly listed transcendentals, along with truth and oneness. Of course, goodness can be said in many ways. A good apple, a good dog, a good boy, a good angel, a good height, a good time, a good place, a good movie. Aquinas explains, In this way, an essence is called good inasmuch as it is a being. Hence, just as it has being by participation, so it is also good by participation. For Aquinas, goodness is being insofar as it is desirable. Now, just as God is essential being, esse essentialiter, because only God is subsistent being, he subsists in himself, his, whereas be, creatures are being by participation, that is, creatures have being, whereas God is his own being. So also, Aquinas says, God is called good essentially because he is goodness itself. However, creatures are called good by participation because they have goodness. So again, on a natural level, by the mere fact of their existence, all creatures have a certain natural kind of goodness, which is different from saying that they are morally good. But we are simply speaking of the goodness of being itself. Nonetheless, grace is a supernatural participation of the divine goodness, a supernatural goodness caused in the soul by God, which is a likeness of God's own goodness, and is sometimes referred to as the image of grace or the image of Christ, which is of another order than the purely natural image of God in us. And this image of grace, in turn, says Aquinas, prepares the soul for its final conformity to God in beatitude in heaven, known as the image of glory. This is a divinization or deification, being made like God of the human being by God's conforming the person to himself in the beatific vision. The image of glory, therefore, is the highest form of participation possible to a creature other than that of the hypostatic union itself, the union of the divine and human natures in one divine person in Christ. St. Thomas points out that the last and most complete participation in God's goodness consists in the essential vision of him, the beatific vision, by which we live together with him socially as friends, since in that beatitude consists. So, in the next video, we will begin our inquiry into the Trinity, this great mystery of our faith. But in order to better prepare ourselves for this, I suggest that we begin already tonight to ask God for the grace to grow more deeply in union with Him, through His enlightening our minds with His truth and inflaming our hearts with devotion and love. In fact, we need God's help and grace in order to pray well. Let us recall our Lord's words in John 15, verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit in it by itself, unless it abide in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. Let us then abide in the love of the Lord, turning our hearts and thoughts to his presence within us, and seek to appreciate and grow ever more deeply 
in union with the Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in the next video of our introduction to the Trinity, I will be sharing with you about God's eternal and temporal processions.